So this evening's called Design Education with a Cause. So I want to get some audience participation here. So let's get a show of hands. So how many people here are part of the San Antonio tech scene? Okay, about half of you. Okay, so how many people are here are parents with kids who are into coding or design? Wow, way to go. And how about parents with kids who are into an online career of some sort? Great, awesome. And how many of you came here to see one of the panelists? Cool, <laughs> awesome. Since this is about education, how many people actually today have jobs that are related to their major in college? And how about the opposite? Who, who doesn't have a job today that's related to what they majored in? All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna give a little anecdote about my own personal journey, and I wanna start off by giving you a cute picture of me when I was a kid. So, uh, <laughs> aw. So as, as my shirt tells everybody, um, I was 100% muscle back then, 0% um, inhibition. So back when I was a kid, I didn't have school, I didn't have a job, I didn't really have any responsibilities other than just like showing up to eat my food and going to bed when I was told to. And so what I spent the majority of my time doing was drawing pictures and comic books and like being in my imagination and just running around and just being in an imaginary world. And it was just like full self-expression as a kid. And then I eventually got to school and some of that changed. There's another cute picture of me, you know. Uh, I think I'm like 15 or 16 there. Um, and um, it kind of changed. Like I, I spent a lot of time in a building with a bunch of people doing something that I didn't necessarily find relevant to my life or really added value or that I was interested in or that I cared about. And I struggled a lot, uh, almost on a daily basis, just to get my homework done and to focus and to get A's and B's. And at nighttime, I would play in punk bands or rock bands. My brother's here, I was, a, I was in a band with him for a few years. And um, I discovered um, digital creative software. So I'd get into Photoshop and Illustrator I uh, built my first website when I was 12, when we still had dial-up. Um, and I spent all my time just being creative and building things. Um, and then I went to college in California where I actually got to study that. Um, and I got to spend all of my time 24-7 just focusing on being creative and enhancing my skills. Um, and then eventually, though, uh, I made my way into the working world, and I started working for the man. So this is me hard at work. Uh, um, <laughs> and so uh, I figured out a way to get paid to do the stuff that I actually love, which is building websites uh, for a newspaper in Indiana. Um, however, I, I found myself pretty frustrated with the system or, or the company that I worked for. I thought, like, why are we doing it this way? Like, why is the salesperson the one who's like doing all the creative thinking with the client and like uh, why are we pricing it this way and like I just felt like I could have done things so much better on my own and also I had this thing where I get really tired in the middle of the day and I would like go down into the basement and like sleep in the corner um, and so for like about two years I thought man I really like just wish I could do it my way and so I read all sorts of books uh, one was uh, I forget, it was like Escape the Nine to Five was the first book I read. And then I read Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Uh, how many people have heard of that book? Okay, great book if you haven't read it yet. Um, and as soon as I read that book, I'm like, this is it. Like, this is my life. And so um, I joined up with a friend and uh, we planned our escape. Like, he was working in HR, but he's like really smart and like crafty and creative. And so he was like, hey, John, I think I want to learn web development. Uh, what should I do? And I said, well, you want to learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, and you know, database languages. And so he went to the library and he got his books. And then I talked to my boss and I quit. <laughs> and 
we started our own company. So that was seven years ago that I quit my job. And, um, and it actually was kind of funny. Uh, the week before um, I was going to tell my boss that I was going to quit my job, she asked me to come in and she actually laid me off. So I got a severance package because the company was shrinking. And so really kind of like, yeah, it was good. <laughs> and, and then they shut down our... And they shut down our department, which meant I could get all the clients that they previously had. So it really worked out pretty nicely. So I, I say up here, seven years of freedom and challenges. So working for yourself is a lot of excitement, and it's a lot of dread and stress and frustration and worry and uncertainty. And a big part of that was, even though I went to a school that taught me a craft, there wasn't anything about entrepreneurship or interpersonal skills or writing contracts or finances. There was none of that. And so we're just kind of figuring it out as we go and just you know, running into all the roadblocks and just figuring out what to do. And so for the past seven years, the three main things I've been involved in are Telix Design, which is my own web design firm. Um, it started off as another name, and um, I switched it to Telix when I moved to New York. And then while I was in New York, um, I started working with Wix, uh, which is a web design platform. And I got really involved with them, acting as a consultant. Um, I was on their board of advisors. Uh, I was like a tech um, support pro. Uh, I test a lot of their products. Um, I got to work with their you know, product developers and was a beta tester. And then um, Laserbird, is the product of a project that was a part of a program I went to called Landmark, where you actually create your own nonprofit as part of the project. And so my idea was to start a web design school. And so I launched an after school program in New York uh, where I taught high schoolers um, essentially how to do what I'd figured out how to do over the last seven years. And that brings us up to today. So I want to talk about the current state of affairs um, with regards to our education system. Our U.S. ranking among the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, out of the 34 countries that are a part of that, where do you think the United States ranks in terms of math? Any guesses? Just shout them out. Huh? Huh? Well, it's 30. Yeah, so we're 30th in math. And then what do you think about science? Nineteen. Yeah, so it went up a little bit for science. And then how about for reading? Twenty-four. All right, so some of the countries that outrank us are Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand, Norway. <laughs> yeah, go Korea. <laughs> Netherlands and Germany. But yeah, so now I want to talk about high school dropouts. So currently in this country, every nine seconds, a high schooler, or not just a high schooler, but any child in school is dropping out. So there, two students just dropped out during the time of that sp uh, slide. And then we've got the issue of college debt, right? So the, all ed, the, the average graduate debt currently is $35,000. And then the, uh, a recent poll in 2015 uh, stated that among those graduates, only 15% actually had career-level jobs. This is partially due to educational inflation. So what I mean by that is 20 years ago, if you had a degree, you essentially had a job. Like, that was sufficient. Um, but today, uh, a bachelor's degree isn't really going to cut it in a lot of um, instances. So you actually need a master's degree or a PhD for a lot of jobs. So let's rewind for a second. So how did we actually get here to this state? Well, we have to rewind all the way back 
to 1893. So back then, there's, you know, the Industrial Revolution is taking place and there's a massive economic shift um, from people living in rural regions and moving into cities. And so we needed to adopt or adapt our education system to prepare people for our factories and manufacturing. So there was a, a prioritization of manufacturing skills. And in that sense, creativity is really discouraged because when you're working in a factory, you don't have to be creative. It's set up systematically so that you have to have a task that you do over and over as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so it's set up for mindless repetition, essentially. And that was good in creating a robust middle class. However, in today's society, that model is outdated. And the result of that kind of education is we have students with a have to mentality. You have to go to class at a certain time. You have to get good grades. You have to take these classes. And that's why we find students describing school as boring or frustrating or irrelevant. And children coming through this system are going to be marginalized. And if you've been watching the news in the past couple years, there's been a controversy over minimum wage, um, specifically with McDonald's. Uh, their workers are saying, hey, we can't afford to raise a family uh, on, you know, like $7 an hour, right? And so does anyone know what the minimum wage in Texas is? Yeah. Or maybe it's 75, I'm sure. That's what I got. So if you're working 40 hours a week full time, that comes out to about $1,000 a month. Like, okay, so I, I mean, I don't eat out a whole lot. You know, I cook at home. I ride my bike everywhere. I don't even have a car. I buy clothes like maybe every four months and I can't live on $1,000 a month. And I don't even have kids or anything. So that's, it's pretty crazy. And a lot of corporations, you know, they're pushing back. They're like, well, we can't afford $15 an hour. We're gonna have to raise our prices. So what are they doing instead? We're getting automation. So you can see here's a picture of McDonald's where you know they've replaced their you know front counter people with touch screens. And so now it's just the technicians in the back that are ones making the burgers. Well, that's not gonna be the case for long because now they're figuring out how to automate making burgers. So you could have a fast food joint with just a single technician running the machines. You might think, okay, well, that's just like blue collar, you know, minimum wage type jobs. But actually, AI is taking over a lot of white collar jobs as well. So um, there's actually tons of uh, bots that are actually trading on the stock market. And they actually do a lot better than humans because it's all statistical. It's very mathematic. They can do it in split seconds. And so you have bots that are all trading with each other. And then you might think, well, okay, that's mathematical, but AI can't really take over creative jobs, right? Well, Google has DeepMind, uh, which is a um, neural networking based AI that can actually create its own artwork uh, if you feed it some images. And there's even AI that's writing music. So you give it some rules like we want it in this scale, we want it this tempo, we, uh, here's a few other songs that we like, write a melody. And they'll actually write melodies. And then a, a recent breakthrough is that an AI beats uh, a Go champion. Um, and a lot of people might not know the significance of that. But if you go back to, I think it was 1995, when an AI beat the world ch uh, chess champion, like before then they were saying, oh, like we can't teach uh, computers to think strategically. And they did, and they beat a uh, champion. And with Go, um, there were experts saying, well, Go is infinitely more complex than chess uh, because, you know, there's like literally trillions of different moves and possibilities you can make. And recently they taught an AI to play Go and to win. And something more relevant to this crowd, uh, they taught um, AI to play uh, Nintendo. And so basically it would just, they didn't give it any information at all. They just said, here's the game, figure out how to play it. And it would just keep going and failing and failing and failing 
until it eventually figured out how to play the game and it was like better than any human player. And then lastly, AI driving is something that's coming up really quickly. So Apple, Google, Uber, Lyft, Volkswagen, they're all figuring out how to build self-driving cars. Um, so now you could hail an Uber and there'll be no driver inside. You'll get inside and go where you wanna go. But the future doesn't have to be bleak though, right? So this is actually a moment of opportunity. So nowadays, it's actually easier than ever to run a business, as a lot of you guys know who are here. So how many people here either have an Airbnb or have stayed at Airbnb? Great. They say on their, their homepage, the average income of an Airbnb person is $350 a week, which is great. I mean, and that's just for having a room in your house. So you're making more than the minimum wage just by having a room. And then there's YouTube, right? So does anyone recognize this guy? Yeah? Uh, who here doesn't recognize him? Okay, so this guy's name is PewDiePie, and he is currently the highest grossing YouTuber online. And anyone wanna guess how much money he makes per year? Yeah? Yeah, so he makes $15 million a year. And what do you think he does? <laughs> He, he plays video games. That's all he does. He doesn't have any special equipment. He just plays video games and people subscribe to his channel and he makes 15 million from ad revenue. What if you wanna like have your own online store? Or you wanna build a site for your company? Well, there's all sorts of web design platforms out there. Uh, there's Wix, there's, Wor there's WordPress and there's Squarespace. All of them you can start for free or you know, you know close to nothing. There's Upwork. So if you have a special skill that can be delivered online, so if, you, if you're a really good writer, if you can edit video, um, if you can like design, uh, you can get a job online using sites like Upwork. Or if you wanna run your own company, you can hire people on Upwork. And then Kickstarter. If you have a great idea and you don't have the funds, just throw it up on Kickstarter. So I actually have a friend I shot a video for and he raised almost $100,000 for his watch company on Kickstarter in about a month. And then there's companies like Stripe, which allow you to accept uh, credit card payment online. And they recently came up with a Stripe Atlas, which is essentially they will provide you all the tools and guidance to start your own legal business entity. And then there's places like Geekdom here, where for $50 a month, you can get office space. It's like awesome. I haven't seen prices like that anywhere. I mean, kids want it too. So eight out of 10 teens that are polled say that they want to be their own boss. And alternative educations abound. So we've got Code Up, Represent. And uh, I was just talking to someone at Geekdom today about how you know, he got a computer science degree where they taught him a lot of theory, but no real technical skills or like what, what's actually being done in the workplace or like what he actually needs to know. And then there's classes like Khan Academy, completely free online um, video tutorials. Uh, they won a contest that Google hosted and they won a million dollars. There's sites like Skillshare where you can actually post your own tutorials online and have people pay you. And then there's sites like Coursera and MIT which are essentially college level courses that you can attend online entirely for free. And then there's methods like unschooling. Has anyone heard of unschooling? So it's kind of like an alternative to homeschooling, um, but it really, it's a learner chosen activities. So where life and learning are essentially considered the same thing. And the students really get to pursue their own interests at their own pace. So some people might, think like, oh, well, they're just like doing whatever they want. They're not gonna learn anything, right? Well, when they pulled the graduates of this type of learning, they found that 83% of unschoolers went on to get higher ed. And the average age that actually pursued higher education was 16. So they're actually finishing school ahead of time. And then the percent of grads that are self-sufficient financially um, are 78%. 
And the, per um, the percent that consider themselves entrepreneurs is 53%. And finally, the seven out of 10 of them listed the top benefit of unschooling as self-motivation. And then there's this topic of meta-learning. Who's heard of that term? Yeah. Yeah, so it's basically learning how to learn, like developing strategies on, okay, I don't know how this works. I don't know the answer to this. I'm running into a problem. How do I solve it? Like that's meta-learning. So really today we need to shift from a manufacturing model to an innovation model. Or kids need a system that's inspiring, that's fun, that's digital, that's adaptive to their particular learning styles, that's hands-on so that they can actually get to learn it through um, participation, and that's relevant. And we need a system that encourages curiosity, meta-learning, and uh, questioning. So not just like, this is the answer, don't question it, but actually get them to be curious in the question and to learn how to debate um, and be able to, to give an argument for their own uh, side and tinkering. So actually give them you know, some old electronics and have them take it apart and figure out how it works. So I just want to thank everybody for coming out here. It's been awesome. I want to challenge everybody to really come up with an action item for yourself. What are you going to do tomorrow that's going to make a difference? Like really take it on. And, and mingle, network with each other. Thank you.